Awesome. Thank you guys for joining us. I am excited to be here with Eric, CEO of Plaid. And you actually have a, a pretty in-depth uh, fintech background before Plaid. You were the chief revenue officer at Bluevine, head of sales at Square. So we're going to cover Plaid, but we'll have a much broader conversation also. But to start, congratulations on the acquisition. Thank you. $5 billion by Visa, biggest fintech acquisition, I think top five uh, acquisitions in a little while. So many of you have probably read a lot of the analysis out there, and I know the deal isn't closed yet, so we can't get totally <laughs> under the hood. But for what you can tell us, how, how do these companies fit together, and why did this happen? Yeah, I mean, there's not that much um, I can say at this point, obviously. But um, the one thing that we are really happy about, it's a fantastic milestone for us as a company, and it's really been the customer reaction. Right? I, I know we were talking a little bit backstage, but you know, the fact that we have so many customers who have reached out who are excited about what this combination means, what Visa can help bring to Plaid, um, what it means in terms of us accelerating our roadmap, us expanding internationally, and us providing even better solutions to all of our customers around the globe is really, really exciting for us. Happy customers is a good thing. And we'll ask you this question again in a few months when the, uh, the deal's all signed. Um, all right, so Plaid, it, you've, you've had to play a rather complicated role in the ecosystem. And we have this expression that we use a lot, which is the battle between the startup and the incumbent is whether the startup can get distribution before the incumbent gets innovation. And that's the fintech world where it's startups versus banks. And we'll, we'll talk about that. You, on the other hand, need the banks. You're extracting data from them. And there are very few fintechs that make it into the headlines with Jamie Dimon and insert other fintech uh, or insert other large bank CEOs. So how have you approached those partnerships? And, and when has it gone well? And what have you done when it's gotten contentious? I mean, we certainly have a unique relationship with the banks. Um, I think from my perspective, you know, I work a lot with our go-to-market teams. And one of the things that we focused on is re really kind of working with the banks as customers, right? So letting them actually experience the power of Plaid and the power of the solutions that we bring to the table, because we think that's what opens up a better understanding on, on the part of the banks to kind of recognize the value on all aspects of the ecosystem. Like if you think about Plaid or the way we think about Plaid, there's really three ecosystems, right? There is the consumer. So we have hundred, hundreds of millions of consumers that use Plaid. We have tens of thousands of developers, and we have 18,000 institutions, right? And the magic is about putting all those three kind of networks and ecosystems together in a way that actually kind of adds value to all three dimensions. Um, and once the banks experience that perspective, not just from the, from the institution side, but they also experience the value that they can get from an actual customer or developer side, that's when you start really seeing kind of those relationships take it to the next level. And is that you're able to convince the banks? So the ones that we talked to, we get a lot at Andreessen Horowitz, they have a fear of becoming the dumb pipes, to use the telco analogy. How do you, how do you get them over, over that hump? Is it just they can't build it themselves and you convince them? I, mean, it's, I don't think it's too dissimilar for what folks talk a lot about, which is it's at the end of the day, it's about building the best possible solutions for consumers. And I think banks understand that as well, right? Like the days are over where you can you know, build this walled garden where your customers aren't going to consider other options. And in that world, like we're not the enemy, right? Like if I'm a bank, who I'm worried about is I'm worried about you know, the other folks that are coming over, starting direct deposit accounts, right? So it's the N26s of the world, the Revoluts of the world, the Mons of the world. It's the folks on, in the, on the US side that are going into that space like SoFi and Credit Karma and NerdWallet. Um, we just help make it easier and we help everybody build better solutions, including the banks, right? And so if I'm the bank and I want to go compete against these new entrants, one way of doing that is by actually partnering with Plaid, working with Plaid to make my solutions better, to create a better customer experience. And now actually I have a really amazing you know, bank account at JP Morgan or at Citi or at Wells Fargo. Yeah. So ironically, the influx of the neo banks from Europe could potentially be a good thing for Plaid. Yeah, I think it will almost... Well, more customers, but it, also it's less more bank customers, focus. and it, it helps kind of, again, facilitate, like, that ecosystem. Yep. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about Plaid, because what you're known for is the bank data product, right, which is where you started. Yep. But you've done a lot of things since then. Can you, can you talk us through some of those products, and then we'll go into the future? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? I mean, when, when Zach and William originally started the company, they were actually working on something completely different, right? They realized that they, in order to power that product, they needed good quality bank information. And so that's how they ultimately kind of went down this path. But the initial product was literally just kind of connecting to banks and pulling down the account and routing number. That was it, right? And so since then, we've expanded in a number of vectors. We've obviously gone from one bank to you know, 18,000 institutions, right? So that's one. The second is 
we've gone beyond just account and routing number, we've now gotten into transactions and balance and assets and, and all the other products that exist out there. The third vector was we ended, and that's part of like just drawing down more information from those existing connections. And then finally, we've gone to different types of institutions, right? So it's not just bank accounts anymore. It's what we call liabilities, right? So it's you know, student loans, car loans. It's literally anything that sits behind a username and password anywhere in the world, we can ultimately access, aggregate, and kind of help consumers and developers build much better solutions. Yeah. One of my favorite things that's coming is anybody with student debt in the audience? I imagine there's several of you. <laughs> Yes, you're probably logging into servicers that were built in the 1970s, and it's difficult to figure out what the hell is going on. Why hasn't there been more fintechs here? Part of the reason, I think, is it's very difficult to get the data out of those servicers, which is a product that you guys just launched. Exactly. So that's exactly how we think about it, right? Like, and, and we're very much looking at all times at what do consumers need, right? So we hear a lot from actually kind of end consumers. Mm -hmm. And then what do our developers need? And what are they looking for in terms of kind of building that next generation of amazing solutions? Um, and that's pretty much how we decide what to build next. Yep. What are, do you have a couple of sort of end or developer applications that have been built that have surprised you or you think that have been particularly exciting that, that Plaid has enabled? Not that you're picking favorite children. Just I think that's, yeah, that's really hard. I have two okay. kids at home that you're kind of <laughs> asking me to choose, you know, between like my children, um, which is always gets me in trouble. I like my daughter much better than my son right now, so it's a, <laughs> it's a little sensitive at home. Um, look, I mean, again, I'm going to dodge the question, right? Like, I think there are a lot of great companies, obviously, that have been built on, on Plaid to kind of pick a favorite out of all of them. I think it's hard. Yep. Um, you know, Venmo has come a long way. Uh, Square, where I used to work, has come a long way. Um, so there's many, many, many examples out there. Totally fair. Anybody, it's, uh, anybody who's building an app on Plaid in the audience, that's definitely one of your favorites. So. Yes. I mean, I, to be we'll fair, actually, that. That, that is a, that's a good point, which is <laughs> I do have a love for like, the folks that are really building something from small. Yeah. Right? Like, and that's true for everybody at Plaid. Right? Like, I think we're like, a truly like, a developer-first company. And it's not that we don't have a lot of large customers over time, but at the end of the day, like, most of our engineers, most of our product folks, and even a lot of the folks on, on, on my team from a go-to-market perspective, like, what they really love is, like, seeing these small companies end up, like, being successful. Um, and so if I had to pick a category, I certainly love what we call startup. We actually, that's actually the category that was that, uh, internally, and we put a lot of energy and effort behind making sure that those folks have a great experience and, and can be successful. Yep. All of, all of my companies use Plaid, so they're, they're very excited. <laughs> uh, now, you guys started in the U.S., yeah. but evidently this developer and customer need is not a U.S.-only phenomenon. It's global. And the banking systems, regulations, very, very different in different countries. You know, if we flash over to Europe, there's an open banking initiative. So there's one school of thought which says, well, the banks have to give their customer data, so, like, do we need Plaid? They're all going to build these APIs. You could take the other side, which, which Plaid has taken, that actually this is a positive and Plaid is needed even more. Can you talk about your, your European approach? Yeah, I mean, I'm actually German, so I've, I've had my fair share of, of struggles with my, my German regulator friends over the years. <laughs> um, but the, the good news of in Europe um, is, you know, I think fundamentally Europe has decided that, like, the bank account information or any kind of account information is ultimately the consumer's, right? It's your information. It's not the bank's. It's not Plaid's. It's yours. And so as a consumer, you should be able to decide how you want to use that information. And if you, if you want to use that to you know, power a PFM that helps you make better financial decisions, that's, it's fantastic. If you want to be able to use that data to get a better mortgage or a better loan or a better car loan, that's fantastic. Like those are the things you should be able to do. I think as Plaid, it's our job to make sure that it's incredibly transparent to the consumer what they're sharing, how they're sharing it. And so what open banking in Europe has done, I think it has once and for all answered the question around whose data is it. It's made very clear that it's the consumer's data and that at the end of the day, banks or other institutions in time like, are not permitted to prevent the consumer from duly permissioning kind of their access rights to someone like Plaid. Right? And so that's a fantastic win. I think we're heading there in the U.S. as well. Um, but in the U.S., it still exists in a gray area. Right? So there's no law on today on the books that would prevent a bank even if you want Plaid to access that data, even if you want to use Venmo, if you want to use Square, if you want to use Acorns, there's no law in the books that would prevent the bank from actually trying to keep that from happening, mm -hmm. right? And so from that perspective, it's a, it's a huge win. Um, now, in terms of why Plaid is still valuable, nobody really wants to invest in doing that across all the different institutions that you would have to do in Europe, right? So you still would have to connect to hundreds of banks, thousands of banks in order to have a good experience, and you'd have to be able to do that in a way that converts, that's secure, that's all the things that we literally invest 
blood, sweat, and tears every single day to just make it a little bit better for everyone, right? And so um, there's every company there has a different core business. That's what they want to focus on. And so as long as we can come in and we can make it incredibly easy for them to tap into that information, to do so securely, and to do so in a way that helps their customers convert in, a, in, in the most efficient way possible, I just think there's a lot of value that we can still bring to the table. Yep. And then as you think beyond right now, if you're Plaid in the US, Plaid in Europe, you look at a lot of other ecosystems where the fintech ecosystem is just not as well developed. I spent a lot of time in LATAM and often we'll look at, you know, take a country like Colombia, 14% credit card penetration, 80% smartphone penetration. We're just very, very early days of a fintech ecosystem cropping up. There's no Plaid there yet. How do you see that infrastructure layer developing in, in other countries around the world? So I, mean, I think it's crucially important. I, I do think that over time, and I, I feel like I've seen this a number of times in my career, right? Where like the insight itself isn't that clever, mm -hmm. right? It's like when I first joined Square, you look at like mobile point of sale versus like old school cash register. Like it doesn't take much to figure out, right? That like over like any meaningful period of time, it's not gonna be old school cash registers that are gonna win <laughs> out. And so, I think the same is true here, right? Like over time, consumers everywhere will want to use these tools. They want to use these products. And so that infrastructure layer that we've now built in the US that we've built in Canada and we're in the process of building in Europe, I think will become crucial. You know, at the end of the day, we will certainly with Visa now as well, I think have every intention of kind of expanding more quickly globally. But I'm also very much pro anybody else that's locally doing that, right? And whether we ultimately partner with them or we take some other kind of approach, like the faster we can get to a world where people can enjoy these products, the better, right? And like that's what drives us from a mission perspective. It really is about like improving consumers' financial health around the world. Um, and we view ourselves really as like the plumbing and like the service provider underneath that helps make that happen. And it's all of you guys that are the stars, right? You get to build the amazing apps on top of it. You get all the glory and the publicity. Like I generally try to avoid situations like this where I'm up on stage. I would much prefer <laughs> it be our customers and others who are building things. Um, but, but I love that. Like it's, that's why I joined the company, right? It's because it, we really view it as like, we're the service, we're the plumbers. Um, but without us, obviously, you know, the world isn't nearly as smooth. Uh, and so from the, from the outside, you know, Plaid has been on this meteoric rise over the last few years. What do you think is the biggest risk to, to Plaid's success? The biggest risk? Um, I think the risks always change, right? Um, I think right now it's certainly one risk, I, and I don't think it's a big one. I've been really impressed with our team. Yeah. But anytime you have the kind of success that we've had, um, you, can, you can catch yourself and be like, hey, I've won. Right, as opposed to it's just one more milestone on building something really, really great. Um, and the analogy I've used a lot with my teams is like, think of like sports, right? Like there's plenty of sports teams, and I'm German, so I love soccer more than, but like I'll use basketball and football to make it easier. <laughs> um, but like there's plenty of teams, right, that won like one championship and then they were never heard from again, right? And that's not how I want Plaid to be thought about, right? Um, and so ultimately, it's on us to kind of really come back to work every single day with the same kind of relentless effort that got us here and continue to make our products, our solutions better for our customers, for consumers. And if we can do that, I think we will build something like really phenomenal and something that will have a long lasting impact on the industry as a whole. Um, but that's the challenge. Yep. Um, last question on Plaid and then we'll go a little broader. We were talking a bit about this like la backstage, how you've been taking data out of these walled gardens, but then the next step is to provide sort of broader solutions, more opinions around it. Can you, can you talk a bit about the, future of Plaid's product roadmap? Yeah, I mean, I'll talk about it in vague terms, yeah. but fundamentally, um, you know, I think that so far Plaid has been about data access, right? And so we talked about kind of the various vectors in terms of more institutions, more types of data, doing it internationally, continuously kind of improving the quality of that. Um, but over time, the other really valuable thing is actually providing answers, right, to all of you, right? So if you think about becoming a Plaid customer, you know, and you're trying to make a decision, like should you give me $10,000, yes or no, in today's world, I can give you data that you didn't have access to before that helps you make a much better decision. But fundamentally, all the work of like you having to come up with that answer is still yours, right? I could start complementing that with what I would think of as solutions, which can draw on like a much broader view that we have of, of the customer, right? Or of the ecosystem as a whole that can actually end up allowing you to make a much better decision around should you give me $10,000, yes or no? And so, um, it's hard to get into like specifics, but there's a number of things that we're working on there that I think really will help people build much, much 
better outcomes mm -hmm. much more quickly because we're not just giving you the data and like asking you to go figure it out, we're actually helping you give, get the answer. Yeah, so more of the work is gonna happen on Plaid side. To some extent, I think yeah. there's always work that happens on the, there, there's always ways you'd want to distinguish it. I mean, I was a customer of Plaid's for many years at Square and at Bluevine. Um, and so the, the, the key there is, even if you give me better, like the, the last five, 10% still matters, right? And ultimately, like that's still the difference between winning and losing, like in the marketplace, right? Yeah. And so it's not like anybody's absolved of doing that. But in, in many cases, if you end up having to spend like the first 80%, I think that's hard, and you see this across industries now, where more and more, it's not like you're building something from zero all the way. What you're doing is you're taking many, many different things off the shelf. You're going from zero to 80 very quickly. You're uniquely combining them, and then in certain key cases, you're taking it from that 80 to the 90 to the 95 to the 99, whatever, and that's what creates the magic. Yeah. No, I think a big piece of what you guys have done is enable smart entrepreneurs to focus on the unique customer insight or the unique product insight that they're bringing, not rebuilding the infrastructure. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So if we talk more broadly about infrastructure, we often use this expression now that the Amazon Web Services moment is coming to financial services. And the analogy I like to use is if you think, what did it take to start an internet company 15 years ago? Like you might actually drive to Fry's and buy some servers and put them in your truck and drive them back to your office and rack them in a server room. Like that sounds crazy, but it's not that long ago that that was happening. Today, many of you have probably experienced this, to build a financial services company, you're still kind of doing that. Like you're finding a bank sponsor, you're finding a core system that was built 40 years ago, and, 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 and. Luckily, you're not integrating with banks all by yourself anymore, you've got Plaid. Where do you see, like for the rest of that stack, the big opportunities or the areas that we should be excited about that are gonna be, I'll call it Platified, type next? I mean, there's a lot of different pieces to it, right? Like there's kind of the whole infrastructure layer around like even like things like KYC, et cetera. Like ultimately, I think that's exactly what you want to create, cr off create. And like whether we end up creating that ourselves or we end up creating that through partnerships, yep. what we want to be able to get to is we want to have developers come, right? And we want to kind of do, in a way, like right now it's, it's all the rage, right? But it's like kind of what Shopify or in some ways even Square has been able to do, right? Where it's like, hey, I'll give you all the solutions. They kind of work out of the box. And it's really, again, this like zero to 80 kind of analogy where you can do that across many, many, many different things, and then you can build like your own special kind of magic on top, right? And so that's the road that we're on, and that's what I mean even by solutions, right, where we start creating some of those things. And so there's a lot of categories like that, right? Like KYC is one, like international credit is another, and there's a lot of companies kind of innovating in those areas. Um, but I think that's where you're headed. Like you don't want to be in a position as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur where you have to have 25 different relationships, right, to get this thing off the ground. You'd much rather just have like a few key relationships, have them pr kind of bring you the solutions that you need to kind of build on top of kind of as one overall integrated package yep. and then go from there. Yep. And preferably those companies were started, you know, within this decade and they're providing you this service as a service. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, you talk about KYC, AML, some of the regulations, like some of the larger banks have like 10% of their staff yeah. in those departments. And you think that like a company like Chime, as they scale, is that going to be their future? Hopefully not. Hopefully many of you are going to build those solutions. And then in the grand scheme of things, it's like you pointed out, right? There's still many countries in the world and even in the US where not everyone is using fintech products, right? Um, but I think there's more and more studies being done that show just the benefits of like fintech solutions, like on consumers broadly. And so that trend will only continue, right? Like there's no doubt in my mind that like 20 years from now, like pretty much everyone is gonna have FinTech apps as their means of like kind of managing their, fin their financial life, right? The idea that you're still doing it like with a spreadsheet somewhere or like on pen and paper, I think will be completely um, obsolete. Yep. And, and that, that is amazing. I mean, that is what we did at Square, right? Or, and, and, continue to, and Square continues to do today for small businesses, right? Where like literally people were running like million dollar businesses on like a spreadsheet with like a very low level of kind of support, right? And so now you can provide these tools to people, both consumers and others, in a way that like, hey, it again, takes every single consumer from zero to 80, right? Like it gives you the right recommendations. It makes sure you're not investing your money in like high cost funds that are ripping you off. It makes sure you're paying off your high interest debt first, like all those types of things. Just the level of sophistication that I think fi FinTech tools are gonna be able to bring them that, they're un gonna unlock, I mean, billions and billions and billions of, do of dollars of value. Yep. Uh, one of the really cool things I think that you gleam from talking to you in the first five minutes is just how passionate you feel about Plaid's mission, which is ultimately you know, enabling developers to help consumers. 
what areas, if we think from the consumer perspective, where do you think the areas that are still ripe for more entrance or there are problems that are unsolved that you're excited about? I mean, you talked about it. So student loans, I think, in the U.S. is a big one, right? Like, I'm lucky I come from a country where we actually get our college paid for right, or university paid for, so it's a little different. But in the U.S., I think that's a huge opportunity. Um, there's a lot of these opportunities around making sure that you're actually, like, um, paying down, like, the right kind of debt, right? And so it's just shocking like how often people are like making like and, and it's it's not that they just don't have the time right like our lives are busy you have families like we both have kids right yeah. like i don't have the time to like go spend like well am i should i pay off the 17 percent first or the 15 percent first or the 13 percent first but all those small decisions over time actually really add up right and you think about we live in a live in a, in a time where like half the people in the u.s don't have access to you know a thousand dollars and so a lot of these tools could very easily kind of help people save that and much more and it just becomes automated. And I think more and more you'll see that where like there will be brands out there that just build such trust that essentially consumers say, look, you do it for me, right? And whether that's ultimately powered by artificial intelligence or other types of solutions, you literally are doing it for me. And then I just kind of live my life the way I want to, knowing that I have somebody that's basically like an automated financial advisor with like a godlike view of all my assets, right? Like making sure that everything is the way it's supposed to be. Yep. No, I am looking for it. Software will make much better decisions than humans in this case, and uh, we're getting there. Or at least give people the choice, right? Yeah. Like, I, I, I'm not one to say, hey, it has to be software, but like, I would, as a consumer myself, I would love the option to just say, look, put this on autopilot, right? Like, I trust whatever the brand is, and they're going to help me get to a much better outcome, much lower cost, much better returns, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. No, you look at um, the trillion dollars of credit card debt, depressing statistic in the U.S. Most people who have credit card debt have it across three to five cards, all with variable APR rates. You generally don't know what the APR rate on what card is, and so this is exactly a problem that is very, very ripe for software. Yeah, I remember, like, when I first came to the U.S., my first credit card was $200, and it was, like, a 30-something percent APR. And it was the only way I could get access to the system in, the, in, the, in America. Like, I would have never been able to get a car, like an apartment even, right? Like, literally, like, you credit check me for an apartment, like, I wouldn't have been able to live anywhere if I didn't have the credit card. And so um, now, not only do I think with tools like Plaid, you can get much better data on people, right? So you can see what's in my bank account, you can see what's in my investment accounts, you can see what, that I've paid my student loans, you can see some of these other kind of data points. Um, and as a result, you would get, I would get a better product. Like yep. if I came to the US today, I would get a much, much, much better product than I did back then. Yep. Uh, one of the other big trends I think that's going on in this space is we've seen, thankfully, lots of new ground up fintechs. But we're now seeing in the vein of every company wants to become a fintech company. Many consumer companies, B2B companies, figuring out that it makes a lot of sense to launch financial services for the first time. Obvious examples being Uber and Lyft, like they might be your rideshare company, but if you're a driver, they're also your bank. What have you seen in this vein, and how do you see how do you see that trend progressing? I mean, there's definitely a lot of people that are approaching us um, I bet. From, from that vantage point, but I also think it's an opportunity for anybody starting a business today, right? It's like, if you can figure out how to provide kind of that service and make that easier, again, it's not Uber's core business isn't, right, to try to make sure that like their drivers get paid fast enough. That's crucial to them, because they need to grow both sides of their, their marketplace. Um, but if they had like a really great solution that someone else had built for them, they would absolutely take advantage of that, right? And so Lyft would do the same and on and on it goes. And so, you know, I agree. I think Zach and others, you have said this for a long time. I do think every company is on its way to becoming a fintech company, but that doesn't mean every company is going to like build it themselves. Most of them, I think at the end of the day, are actually going to look to others to kind of help, build the, help them build the right solutions. Um, and so there's a ton of opportunity in that space in general. Yeah. More customers for the future infrastructure companies. Yep. Uh, excellent. So I wanted to end. I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the audience, uh, maybe fintech entrepreneurs, aspiring fintech entrepreneurs. Any advice you'd give on new companies starting up in this space or just smart people looking to get in? I always give a very German answer to this, which is like, I find that like when people talk about this, like people overrate the idea portion of it, right? People always talk about like, I need the right idea or my idea isn't good enough or like, I don't yet have the best idea. And at the end of the day, I just think that's nonsense. Like most of the great companies that you've seen built, like it wasn't even the idea that they were already started with, number one. And number two, 
even if it was, it wasn't like that unique of an idea, mm -hmm. right? Or, or certainly other folks had had the same idea. And so, so much of it just comes down to execution, right? Like, can you hire the right people? Can you go after the right customers? Can you bring on the right investors? Um, those are the questions that ultimately matter. Um, and it's less about like the idea to begin with. And so m what I always encourage people to do is like, if you have something that you're passionate about, right, and you have a team that you think you can go execute well with, go do it. Like don't overthink the idea portion of it. Like you'll still be talking about it five years down the road. And then you're going to be like that one person who's like, well, I had that idea, you know, and now it turned out it was somebody else that did it and they have Uber or they have, you know, whatever company else is out there. Fantastic. On that note, we will let you out to lunch to uh, ponder your ideas. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Eric.